Hello and welcome to season two of the Queen Bee podcast. You might notice we're shifting things up a gear and really honing in on the experience and the life shift that is menopause and perimenopause. To launch off this season, we have the absolute pleasure of welcoming the inspirational Dr. Kelly Teagle. One of the benefits, you might say, of being a female doctor is you get the opportunity to experience the menopause journal firsthand, which brings lived experience to how you work with your female patients. In Callie's case, her experience and the experience of her patients led her to create Wellfem, an online medical clinic focusing on supporting women across Australia, specifically around menopause and perimenopause. And so today, Callie is joining us to give us a bit of information and really explore what menopause and perimenopause are actually all about. Welcome, Callie. Thanks, Tanya. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to be part of season two. You're most welcome. Let's launch straight into this. Now, I know when a girlfriend first mentioned to me that I might have perimenopause, I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about. I'd never heard of the term before, and I know I'm not alone here. So it would be really great if you could explain what menopause and perimenopause actually are all about. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a common experience, although I think that, you know, with the media focus lately on the menopause and menopausal transition, that it's starting to become much more um, in a common term in our, in our vocabulary. So menopause, you may be aware, is basically when a woman runs out of eggs. So we're talking about people born with ovaries who right through the reproductive years are popping out an egg, you know, roughly once a month, depending on your medical conditions. And and then at the point where you've ovulated your last egg and it's popped out from the ovary, um, we call that moment in time menopause. Um, and that means that you're no longer capable of having a pregnancy or at least, um, you know, sort of having a pregnancy with your own egg anyway. Um, now, the interesting thing about menopause is that women don't know that they've had menopause until 12 months later because they don't know that it's their last one until they fail to have another one. So the definition is if it's been 12 months since your last ovulation or your last period. Um, perimenopause is kind of a new kid on the block in terms of um, terminology and it's kind of come to represent the lead up to menopause. Or, you know, peri generally means around. Um, so, you know, by definition, you would think that's the time around menopause, but even more so it's come to be um, the time leading up to menopause. And the interesting thing about this, um, I mean, it's all part of the menopausal transition, right? So the menopausal transition is basically the whole subset of hormonal changes you can go through right from beginning to end um, as you go through this wind down of your ovaries. Um, but the symptoms at the different stages can be very, very different. So, for example, you know, in the perimenopause, Pretty early on, maybe the woman's in her late 30s, early 40s, um, you might actually still have plum regular periods pretty much looking like they did before, but you might start to notice that you're getting worsening premenstrual mood symptoms or depression or, um, or migraines or something like that, or your periods are starting to get heavier. Uh, and this can be related to the subtle changes that are starting to happen in your ovaries as they age, and they're not producing these hormones the same way they once did. Then you track on a bit further during perimenopause and you actually start to find um, some months you're not ovulating anything and it's getting quite erratic. And that leads to very, very, um, you know, uh, up and down kind of changes, quite volatile changes in your hormonal environment. And this really impacts on your brain chemistry and can make your moods really quite unstable. And this might be a time when women are describing brain fog, memory issues, irritability, teariness, um, you know, periods are going nuts and all over the place, um, really bad migraines, all sorts of stuff. So this can actually be, in terms of symptoms, the, the worst time of the whole menopausal transition for some women. Um, and <laughs> um, for some women, 
For some women, this is actually the worst time of the whole menopausal transition in terms of their symptoms, because that's when the hormonal upheaval is at its peak for them. And then, you know, we go along a little bit further and then you can start to get really big gaps opening up between your periods, or they just completely stop altogether. And at some point they will when you're no longer having any ovulations. And whilst, um, you know, that, that, can represent a, a loss and a time of grief and a time of, you know, a, a changing sexual and self-identity. There are so many great advantages about not having periods anymore. So a lot of women really love that, love not having bleeds anymore, especially if they've had really awful periods in the past. And uh, interestingly, their mood seems much, much more stable post-menopause because whilst the estrogen, the absolute estrogen levels are low and progesterone tends to be zero beyond that time, um, it's actually stable. It's not going up and down all over the place and, you know, like um, really causing that sort of hormonal chaos it did before. So then treatment, you know, depending on the symptoms, if you've got really dreadful hot flushes or something, it's quite a simple matter to give you a little bit of estrogen or some other non-hormonal treatment that really manages your flushes and you haven't got all the ups and downs to deal with. Yeah, and I'm sort of thinking about my journey <laughs> as you're going <laughs> along there. One of the things that I'd really like to raise, and it's probably because it is really hard to pick up when you are starting that perimenopausal phase, what is related to the hormones and what might be related to something else. But for some of the big things like anxiety and depression, how are there ways that you can work out when they might be more hormonal related than, say, something else that's going on? That's uh, the million dollar question and the really mm. interesting part of working in menopausal medicine for me is that it's all so individual because from woman to woman, we're all so incredibly different. Our context, our psychosocial, you know, environment, um, our upbringing, you know, absolutely everything um, is different from person to person as are your physical and, and um, mental and medical kind of conditions as well. All of these things play into our perception of treatment. So you can't discount, for for example, that um, women at midlife are incredibly busy. They're overtaxed. They're the sandwich generation that's looking after aging parents and looking after difficult teenagers. Hello, it's just the pits. <laughs> and, you know, all this is going, you're at the peak of your career and your responsibilities. Um, you feel like you're torn in 20 different directions and you're giving everybody pieces of yourself and not prioritizing your own health, wealth, welfare and recovery and wellness. Um, so it's a really trying time um, where there's not much left in the tank for ourselves. That all plays an enormous part in not just how bad your symptoms are, but what your perception of your symptoms is as well. Um, so, you know, that's going to be impacting on your sleep and it's going to be impacting on your mood. Now, how do you tease that out from the hormonal changes that are concurrently going on at the time? The answer is you really can't. Um, there yeah. are clues. Perhaps like if you're somebody who, for example, um, had really dreadful postnatal depression, then that might be a clue that you're somebody who's more subject to the mood consequences of hormonal changes. Um, you might also be somebody who's had um, quite bad PMS or um, PMDD, even really serious form of premenstrual mood disorder. Um, and so anything that, seem, that shows you uh, an association of your symptoms with your um, menstrual cycle makes it more likely that it might be subject to hormonal changes of course. But I like to say to my patients, you know, I don't know if the things that I'm prescribing for you are going to help until we actually try them. Because you once once that person is established on some kind of treatment, and then we can go back and revise the score for their symptoms, you know, maybe a few months later, then we start to get an idea of just how much um, was hormonal or not. Um, and it can be that, you know, some women are really hoping for big things that, you know, pinning their hopes on the fact that most of their symptoms are related to hormones, but actually don't do all that great on hormonal treatment, whereas others might get, you know, a really good result. So, yeah, it's a really how long is a piece of string kind of question, <laughs> Tanya. <laughs> well, and talking about it could be anything, what are some of the symptoms that 
women might experience that, that could be related to that perimenopause stage? Yeah, we've mentioned a few already. Um, I find that the, um, let's say, the, the mental capacity and mood type symptoms, I feel tend to be worse in women in the perimenopausal period. So particularly, you know, that mid perimenopause um, and going on towards actual menopause. Um, so stuff like um, cognitive function, they might find, as I do all the time, all of a sudden you're scrambling for that word, that thing, you know, like it's right on the tip of my tongue and I can't remember it. So word finding difficulty, um, cognitive functioning, not feeling as sharp as you used to, forgetting stuff like missing appointments or, you know, putting keys in the fridge or whatever it is. People really start to worry that they're going a bit mad or that it might be early dementia. This is a really big concern, yes. particularly if there's dementia in the family history. And so we have at Wellfem, we actually have done webinars on this and have resources and, and webinar recordings on our website um, for discussions we've had around this because it's so incredibly common. Um, but the good news is that it's really, really uncommon to develop, to start developing dementia and exhibiting the signs of it um, at this age. It's really much more common in the older age group. So usually what we find is that those kind of symptoms tend to settle down and get better after menopause. I'm not entirely sure how much of that is because you just recalibrate what your new normal is <laughs> and it seems yeah. like normal now or how much of it's actual recovery. But, you know, people do report being cognitively much better post-menopause as well as in their mood. So there's those things. Um, of course, you might start to experience, um, you know, m the irritability, um, the teariness, as I said, depression, anxiety is a huge one. You know, women all of a sudden feeling um, you know, inexplicably anxious or even having panic attacks um, in situations that they would have quite normally been quite confident previously, particularly at work. It really starts to impact on people at work. They start to fear they're not up to the job or they um, they think that they're going, oh, excuse me, they start to think, that they're not up to the job, they start to um, fear that like they're going to have a brain fade in the middle of a presentation, it undermines their confidence and they don't feel that they can speak up about it to, at work, particularly if they've got yeah. you know a male boss or somebody young as their boss. Um, so that's sort of, uh, are, you, are you referring sp particularly to the perimenopause here in terms of symptoms? Wow, I'm interested if there's there's other things that we should be thinking about as well. Oh, totally. I mean, you know, once upon a time you could have rattled off maybe a dozen symptoms for, for menopause and perimenopause and now I think they're, you know, somewhere in the 60s or something. It just keeps growing all the wow. time, that things, the things that people are attributing. Um, but, yeah, you know, so you've got your, your, your cognitive things, you've got your mood things, you've got sleep and sleep is, a, it is an interesting one because we don't know how much of it's due to environmental disturbances versus hormones disturbances versus things like other menopausal symptoms because if you're having dreadful hot flushes and sweats at night obviously that's interrupting your sleep as well um, so these things can get a bit chicken and egg you know how much of it's to do with hormones how much of it's to do with environment or external things how much of it's to do with the other symptoms that are contributing as well so that's a biggie um, musculoskeletal aches and pains are very commonly re reported, um, you know, because interestingly, estrogen is anti-inflammatory. So as we start to get variability or lowering of estrogen, you can start to get worsening inflammatory type conditions. Uh, so that's okay. very common. Yeah. And I've then noticed I got a lot of um, jerky leg thing that I'd never had before. Oh, yeah. but I had one leg that would get really restless. Absolutely. Restless legs, yep, yeah, more common. Um, you know, tinnitus and things like that um, might be more commonly reported. Um, I noticed um, during one stage where I had to go off my MHT that my vision very, very quickly deteriorated when I stopped my estrogen therapy. And so I, I do believe that there's quite a big association with just the tone of the muscles, including the muscles of the eyes. Um, you know, Did body you find shape, that came back? 
Not totally, no. No, I, I mean, because obviously there's age-related changes in there as well, um, but I feel like it might might have been accelerated during that time of low estrogen, a bit like bone mass. So your bone mass is, is gradually reducing with age, but it accelerates for a short time um, immediately after menopause. So you can lose 15 to 20% of your bone density immediately right. after menopause, for example. Yeah, so that's, that's a big one. Um, there are you know, sexual changes, there are urino, urinary genital changes that happen. So you might get increasing urinary frequency, um, vaginal dryness, um, discomfort with intercourse, um, you know, reduction in libido, um, just, you know, a huge range of things. Even things like people will talk about itchy skin or feeling like ants crawling under their skin, dry skin, um, you know, hair on their face, all sorts of things. And of course, change in body shape because, you know, as estrogen lowers, we start to then accumulate weight, uh, central weight more easily. Um, and um, it, because lower estrogen definitely changes the distribution of body fat and it makes it harder to retain your lean muscle mass. So you've got to work that much harder to actually keep your, your muscles and bones nice and strong so that we re remain strong and independent into older age. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like, whoa, it's so, there's so much. <laughs> there is not a cell in the body really that doesn't, mm. you know, get impacted by these reproductive hormones in some way. So they have far reaching effects. Um, but, you know, even for, for women who, who, um, you know, are going sailing through the menopausal transition without, you know, having too many symptoms or too much bother, these physical changes, the longer term physical changes of having the lower estrogen are still at play. They just aren't really aware of it. Yeah, for sure. So I guess moving from that into what we'd love to hear is a bit about what your own personal menopause journey was like, because we can talk about the, you know, the medical and it's very, uh, oh, very formal, but it would be just great to hear what an actual experience can be like. <laughs> yeah. Knowing that uh, they're all look, different. <laughs> they're all different, exactly. You know, like I can tell you about my my little trip along the way, but um, everyone's is going to be different. Mine, um, mine was, you know, I guess it, it's a good example, though, of the sort of confounders that can make it hard to actually work out what's going on. So I'm a woman doctor who specializes in um, doctoring other women, you know, in women's health. And yet my, I didn't actually recognize the changes in myself properly at the time. So around my um, early 40s, I had my second child and um, my marriage was breaking down and there was a whole lot of stuff going on. When my son was only one year old, I um, I, I was just really, really struggling um, with irritability, with poor sleep. Um, you know, I was getting really teary and irritable. And with everything that was going on, you know, you can easily sort of say to yourself, well, it's pretty obvious that, you know, I'm I'm overworked, underslept, I've um, got a you know, young baby trying to return to work and my marriage is falling to bits. Of course, I'm going to feel like that. But it wasn't until the flushes set in that I really kind of went, oh, hang on a minute, maybe there's more to this than meets the eye. And of course, because I do deal a lot in women's health, I, I knew the right people to go and talk to and get some tests done and everything. It's one of those when you're particularly young and unexpected um, to be menopausal, that's one of the times when they might actually do a blood test to diagnose menopause. It's usually not required, but if you're younger than normal, they might just check it out to make sure that that's actually what it it is and it's not something else. Um, so in my case, we we worked out that was what was happening, and so I was able to get to get good treatment um, and get back on track. And I didn't have a marine. Oh, sorry, I didn't have periods because I had a marina in as well, which is another confounder. If you're not actually getting those visual clues every month from having a, a period that's starting to go a bit loopy or stopping, um, then it's not it's going to be that much harder to recognise. And a lot of women these days have had a hysterectomy or a marina or an ablation or a medical condition, which means that they don't have regular periods anyway. Um, you know, obviously we've got lots of women who are subject to earlier than normal menopauses because of medical or surgical treatment as well, and they are a really special subset that needs to get really good 
uh, advice about treatment early on so that they can um, make sure that they're not subject to getting, say, um, premature osteoporosis or heart disease down track from, from having low estrogen for too long. So, yeah, they really do need to get good advice. Anyway, so back to me, happily going on, or more or less happily going on for the next kind of 10 years or so on my hormonal treatment and, um, you know, able to then go on and, and build Wellfem, which was amazing because now we can actually help women with their menopausal symptoms regardless of where they are around the country. They can get decent help um, if they if their GP isn't confident in managing it. And um, and so it was a bit of a roller coaster ride. And then um, I think I was 52 when I went for a routine mammogram and, and, and got a recall and they told me the great news that I had breast cancer. Oh, um, so, yeah, that... That put a bit of a crimp in my early 50s and, of course, meant that I immediately came off my hormonal treatment, which is when my eyes went loopy and I started to hobble around like a little old lady from musculoskeletal pain. Um, also, you know, brain fog. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't have spoken to you like this at the time. I just wouldn't have been able to string a sentence together at all. So it, it was a pretty rough time as well as, you know, I'm trying to deal with um, my diagnosis and planning of surgeries and making decisions all at the same time as suffering from incredible brain fog and fatigue and aches and pains from having to come off my hormonal treatment. So it was yeah. not a nice time. Yeah. Um, so that led me to another chapter in in becoming a menopause specialist, which is having to deal with unusual type presentations or, or difficult presentations, challenging presentations, uh, which is, you know, patients who've had breast cancer or, or other medical conditions, which mean that they can't use hormonal treatments. Um, so how do we manage those um, without hormones? And how do we absolutely optimize all of our life choices and lifestyle and everything to, to make sure that we are minimizing the impact of the lower estrogen on our future aging and health. So that's kind of my personal story. And that's what's, um, you know, as we, you know, isn't it funny how life takes you in directions sometimes, you know, I just feel like yep. as a specialist, um, these things are pretty crappy. Nobody wants those things to happen, but it has led me to um, specifically upskill and learn more and make, build a network in those particular directions, which is allowing me then to help other women. So there's always a silver lining. Yeah, and I also had my kids older, like I had my second one mm -hmm. when I was 39, and it's easy to associate all those things that are going on with just the fact that you've got a baby or it's postnatal or it's whatever else because you've gone through this huge hormonal shift with having a baby and then you've moved into this huge dip of going into perimenopause that, yeah, it's which of those hormonal things is it going to relate to? and what does that then mean like for going forward like how do you actually pick up what you need to do is it just you know the survival things and you'll get there and it'll be better or do you actually need to take more action and then you know have different well, look, conversations think, with your doctor recognition is everything um and um, you know, I mean, in that situation, particularly, like, where's the crossover between postnatal depression and and um, perimenopausal depression, for example? You know, it's kind of mm. all one big blob, isn't it? You know, hard to tease it out, but it doesn't really matter because what really matters is how that's imp impacting on the individual, how that's impacting on her functioning, how that's impacting on her relationships, and how she's managing to look after herself and her family. Um, you know, it comes down to function. Uh, so I think recognition is important and sometimes when we're in a bit of a black hole and we're just struggling to survive day to day, we're not the best at um, standing back and looking at that big picture. But I think despite how you might feel, how emotional you are, if you can just open yourself up a little bit to say the reflections of family and friends who are saying to you, we're worried about you or we're noticing this about you. Um, yeah. And, you know, be be prepared, you know, to not take it too personal, but, you know, really look at it um, with an open heart. 
um, and go, you know, I really don't feel myself. Like uh, maybe I actually should get some advice here. Um, a G- your GP is the best place to start always in terms of, you know, any kind of medical basis to what's going on or hormonal basis because hopefully they're the, the medical professional who knows you best. Um, but, yeah, your, your trusted medical person, go and see them, talk to family and friends about what they're noticing. Um, be honest with yourself about your, your reality and what's happening for you. And absolutely, you know, if, if you if you need to either advocate for yourself or find a loved one um, or somebody you trust to help advocate with with and for you, and keep on pushing for what you need in terms of support. So if you're not getting it from your GP, then there are other places you can go. There are, you know, women's health centres and there are subspecialist GPs like us at Wellfam. Um, there are women's, you know, women's health nurses in, in smaller communities. There's lots of different avenues. And, and these days you've got internet communities as well. Although I wouldn't go getting your medical advice from them, but getting support and, and information no. Um, and referral, you know, referral suggestions is not a bad thing. Yeah, and I think it can be really isolating when you're going through these things if you don't have someone, particularly if you're younger, and you don't have someone in your, you know, group of girlfriends who's gone through a similar sort of experience that you kind of ask mm-hmm. them the questions and, you know, as we mentioned earlier, like, feel like you're going crazy, who can I talk to is sometimes yeah, finding those communities online if you don't have them face-to-face where you can at least sort of explore ideas. But, yeah, as you say, mm-hmm. they're not the medical professionals and you're the only one who's a, an expert in yourself, so you need to really partner with someone that you feel comfortable and you can trust to then, mm-hmm. you know, move forward with that. What's the next step for you? Absolutely. You know, women have this tendency not just to put everyone else first, but to actually um, assume that everyone else's opinion is is, uh, more valid than our own. Um, yeah. And that can lead us to feel disempowered and be subject to medical gaslighting and other forms of, you know, fobbing off in general. Um, so it's really, you know, it's really important to if you just kind of go, no, that's that's not right. That doesn't sound like what's happening for me. You know, I think I need to, to search deeper here because, you know, I hear that a lot from women, for example, who, who have just been told, um, oh, look, you know, it's a mood disorder here, have some antidepressants um, without having, you know, any consideration of uh, – what other things might be at play. Um, and certainly I don't believe antidepressants in and of themselves by themselves are ever the solution. There's always got to be a multifactorial solution. You know, there needs to be therapy and exercise and looking at the diet and sleep and all of these other things. Yeah, and I think that that whole of self and whole of your life perspective mm-hmm. to really get that full picture. And I think One of the challenges, and I know this wasn't what we were going to be talking about here, really is that for a lot of us, when we go to see the doctor, it's we go in, we tell them what the problem is, they make a a diagnosis or they look at what they can give you, they give you something and you're out the door. Whereas Mm. what we really need is to have more of a conversation about what is actually going on and, you know, so that you can get an informed uh, opinion as a medical expert. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and we're, we're lucky at Wellfem that we have longer consults than your average GP has time for. But that said, you know, this does not happen in a single consultation. We're talking about, you know, someone who's had been 40, 50 years to get to the point where they are and they're a product of all of that good and bad stuff that went into that person. Um, you don't unpick all of that in just a half hour or 40 minute appointment. No. Um, <laughs> you know, you start to build a relationship and you start to get some advice about what treatments might be appropriate and you can maybe even start a trial of some medication but it always involves you know coming back rechecking in what's working what isn't working you know tweaking it a bit um right oh now we've got your your symptoms your flushes your sleep sorted whatever now let's look at what's holding you back with um you know like cutting down your alcohol or exercising regularly or you know addressing those dietary problems yeah now I'm really eager. I can see your next phase little sign behind your head, so which mm-hmm. I know is not just for people going through the next phase, but for the next phase of your business. Can you tell mm, us a bit more about true. it? 
it's it's all been so exciting and it's been a natural progression from one thing to the next and so it kind of in a way um it 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 um it parallels my own evolution through the menopausal transition and my own priorities and what happened when I had to come off MHT and everything as well so you know when I started Wellfem it was all about that recognition that there are women that you know, are really desperate to get good advice about what's happening through the menopausal transition and get good treatment for their symptoms because they feel rubbish and whatever and they, they need, they deserve that treatment. So we were able to give that to them via telehealth through Wellfem, which is great. And it's so rewarding because, you know, they come back and they go, oh, I feel so much better. You know, I'm sleeping better. I've got more energy and you know, all this. And I go, great, that's fabulous. Now, how are we going to cash in on that and not give all that energy to everyone else in your life? You know, because the oh. problem is, is you've been, you've been, you know, like at the bottom of the cookie jar, giving everything to everyone else. And then when you get some more cookies in the jar, you give them away again. So <laughs> it's like, what do we, how do we then, you know, make, make people at this stage in life? Because what people have to understand is that the menopausal transition isn't just, um, you know, kind of a landmark age related kind of life stage. It's also a physiological landmark life stage because this downturn in your estrogen and everything else means that your bone density drops, your heart disease risk rises, your dementia risk rises. And, all of these things can be really greatly mitigated by just some small, timely, um, you know, lifestyle changes at this point, recognising that you're not going to get away with the stuff that you got away with for the last 40 or 45 years, that you actually have to learn to drive your new body for, and, you know, and, and understand what your new normal and your new reality is in order to have a great next phase. So what we want is, you know, in 20, 30 years, we don't want you falling over and breaking a hip and, you know, kind of melting away. We want you to be strong and independent and able to get up off the floor without, you know, without breaking bones and, um, you know, be able to be fit and well to enjoy all the things that make life worth living when you're older. So this is the opportunity that we have if we can harness that extra bit of energy, um, you know, that we manage to find at midlife to just focus on ourselves. And so that's what Next Phase was all about, creating that space to not only give women permission to focus on themselves for, for a while and actually go, you know, this is this is why this stuff is important right now. You can't delay it any longer. You can't put it off for another 10 or 20 years until the kids are all grown and gone away and whatever. It's, you know, you'll you'll you can't miss this opportunity now. And it doesn't have to cost a whole lot in terms of time and effort, you know. I can demonstrate to women how just doing a few minutes a day of certain targeted activities will make an enormous difference in terms of their risk of developing chronic diseases. So this sort of information and being get, feeling empowered and supported to implement those small changes is what Next Phase is all about. And we, we didn't want it to be another tick box exercise, another hit and run intervention that people have to pay for and find time for in their busy lives, but more so something that actually um, – seamlessly kind of fits in with your life over a longer term. So when people sign up to do next phase, um, they get access to the material for six months and then they at stepwise go through a very um, detailed kind of overview of what's happening in all the different parts of their body and, and their mind and their mindset during this time. So it's like 10 modules over that six months. Um, you know, each module has videos and workbooks and everything to help you draw out the learning points and make them relevant to yourself for each of the specific modules. We've, we start with prep for success and then we go into energy, which involves, you know, like sleep and, and how you metabolize food and all that kind of stuff. And then we go into exercise and food and weight management. And we talk about um, matters of the heart, which is about relationships and, and heart cardiovascular health. And um, we go on to girly bits as well. We talk about, you know, vulvovaginal stuff and sexual issues and things and strength, which is all about bones and character strength and, and themes of, you know, how we, we come through aging even stronger than before. And then we wrap up at module 10 with onwards and upwards, which is, you know, reassessing where we are now and how to move forward. So it's quite comprehensive and it also involves um, not only just getting that kind of, 
education um, and you know all of the support materials but also there's the online community that goes along with it where we have regular live streams and interactions and um, you get several points throughout the program where you have one-on-one -on -one with a personal coach to check in about how you're going for a bit of accountability and refocusing and also um, regular check-ins with a small group. Um, so you get sort of associated with a small group of other participants that you get to know as well. So there's plenty of kind of community and accountability and support going along with that. And um, I'm very excited about it because I think it has huge potential to really help a lot with prevention of chronic disease for people. Yeah, and I think the fact that you, each one is not just about the physical action, it's also about the emotional and the, the other things that are going on in life. Um, because they all have such a you know, holistic flow-on effect from one to the other. Uh, and mm. also what what you might have done for good health in those areas in the past isn't necessarily what your body is going to need going forward because everything has changed. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's it's like the stuff around, around food and weight management is particularly powerful because a lot of people who start yeah. any kind of wellness program go in thinking my number one goal is to lose weight. And what we hope for them over time is that we're actually going to reframe that all around um, – you know, learning to love your body and nourish your body and you know, give it what it needs um, and keep the focus on health and vitality and energy. And the rest kind of follows on and takes care of itself. And so we've got a brilliant mindset coach, Thea O'Connor, who's presenting all the materials for the mindset component. And she has a history of working in dietetics years ago. And the stuff she presents around, you know, emotional eating and body body and mm. self-image and stuff is hugely, hugely formative, you know, as far as the program goes to actually learning to accept and be kind to ourselves as we're aging and giving ourselves what we really need. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome. I can't wait to check it out. Um, mm, if people are interested in knowing more about um, the Next Phase program, you can actually sign up for a series of free samples of the video content to give you a bit of an idea, a bit more of an idea of what it's all about. Um, of course, the Wellfem website has free things on it, like the free menopause assessment tool, which gives you a good idea of what stage you're at and what kind of treatment options yep. might be out there for you. So it's a good starting point, I suppose, in terms of looking up further information. And we've got tons of um, you know, free webinars that we've done in the past that people can look at, blog, blog posts and things like that. And, of course, people can book in for a consultation if they um, feel like they need some support that they're not getting already at, um, from their local doctors. That sounds really great. Thank you. And, of course, we'll mm. also be having lots of different resources, including guest speakers like yourself on our Queen Bee community pages, which is going to be free access as well so that we can make sure that as many women as possible are getting the support and the information that they need. Well, yeah, thank I'm you so very much. I'm so excited about the Queen Bee <laughs> site, actually. I love, I love looking at it. and it's um, Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. Can't wait to see oh, how the I'm, community shapes up. Yeah, I, I'm excited too. <laughs> Today we've been yarning with the amazing Dr. Kelly Teagle. She is the creator of Wellfem, which is a service we highly recommend. And you can connect and book appointments at wellfem.com.au. We'll make sure we've got the link in the description. You can also check out Kelly's Next Phase Menopausal Health and Wellbeing Program at nextphasewellness.com. And we'll also have the link there. Thank you once again for sharing your time, your energy, your experience and your expertise with us today on Queen Bee. It's an absolute pleasure, Tanya.